Hello everyone, this is Brian Germain. So on this jump, what we're gonna be doing is a crosswind plan. So if you're actually gonna execute a crosswind landing, which I think is really great training, make sure that you don't have any traffic, right? So uh, everybody either needs to be on board with a crosswind landing or instead uh, just do a hop and pop or, or something that's gonna separate you vertically, substantially vertically in terms of the timing of your landing. So let's take a look at some navigation. So when you're in a run, you're going with the wind, you maximum ground speed. Holding is when you face into the wind and you've got a lot less ground speed and your glide ratio relative to the earth is quite a bit worse. So that's stuff most people know, but let's talk about crabbing. That's what crosswind's all about. So if you're 90 degrees to the wind line, depending on the speed of the wind, the, the degree to which you side slide, the direction of motion, we call the ground track, is going to vary. So here is a relatively light wind, and you can see the direction of motion. And let's take a look at a little bit more wind. If you kind of close the gap in that triangle created by the two vectors, if you look at the, the hypotenuse, which is an imaginary line here, that's your direction of motion uh, across the Earth. And then in a stronger wind, if you're 90 degrees to the wind line, you're sliding even more, this more severe angle. So now we're gonna look at a running crab. So you've got a lot more ground speed, but you are still sliding to your left in that case. And then in a lighter headwind crabbing, here I'm still uh, you know, making some penetration into the wind. In a holding crab with a stronger wind, I might have that same crab angle, but now I'm moving diagonally across the wind line, a 90 degree angle to the wind. So setting yourself up for the runway or your imaginary runway in a crosswind landing, you have to adjust by turning a little bit into the wind on the yaw axis, and that'll make you move where you want to go. Um, so let's take a look at, at the pattern here. Um, now I've got here a, a kind of a normal pattern for a medium wind day uh, landing at Skydive Voss in the experienced landing area. So this is my final approach in my landing point here. So, obviously, if I had no wind, this pattern would, would be distorted by bringing these pattern points uh, kind of out a little bit like this into a kind of a more square shape, right? But if I have wind, I'm going to shorten my final. If I'm going to do a drift pattern, I'm going to want to have it looking something like this in kind of a medium wind day. In other words, I'm pointed myself perpendicular to my final approach. And as I fly my base leg for this right hand traffic pattern, I'm going to be sliding to my left. All right. So that's that's really important to, to kind of understand how that stuff works, because in a, in a crosswind approach, uh, that concept is going to be applied. So let's let's assume we're going to deliberately do a crosswind landing on this very same day. So that means that final approach is going to be something like that. Now, obviously, we can you know, play with these angles a little bit. Let, let's just say that we're going to do about a 45. Um, and so obviously now to, to fly my base leg, if I'm going to keep things simple, I'm going to fly a base leg that's more or less perpendicular. Um, now, if you know, at base frame, you might think, OK, this is what it's going to look like. Well, not so much. So first of all, on the final approach, the distance that you'll travel is probably not going to be as far. So on a crosswind, you're dealing with the fact that you have to point your parachute a little bit off the wind line to move where you want to go. And if you're not pointed where you're going, you're not going to go quite as far. Um, and that's also true here. Now, uh, it's important to think in terms of on, on your base leg, is this oriented more or less into the wind, right? Or are you going more or less with the wind? So this differentiates into what I call a slow base leg or a fast base leg, right? So in other words, what's your ground speed? And of course, your ground speed uh, is going to dramatically change the length uh, of your base leg, the distance you're going to be traveling. In other words, your relative glide ratio changes quite a lot uh, when you're uh, when you're in uh, a tailwind versus a headwind. So uh, in this case, right, so the wind is traveling in this direction. So that means in order to, to fly this 
path across the ground, my parachute is pointed almost perpendicular to the runway, and I'm sliding, in this case, to my left. Here, the wind is a little bit behind me, so I'm going to increase the distance that I travel, so I might want to bring this point out a little bit. Does that make sense? So I'm in a little bit of a run. Same here, I'm in a little bit of a run uh, as well, but not quite as much of a run, so I might have to shorten that. In other words, if I was truly in a run, my ground, ground speed would be greater than if I was in a crabbing run. Um, and so the idea here is to kind of get a feel for it, uh, maybe fly a, a practice pattern looking at the ground when you're up at 2,000 feet, worth doing. Um, and ultimately, I think the best thing that you can do for planning this stuff is to sit down with a really good coach and deal with today, this specific approach direction, this specific wind velocity, and play with those numbers, play with those locations, and see if you can get it right, and then go and fly it and see, see what it does. But just keep in mind, with a crosswind landing, there's a lot to think about. Uh, there is a tip-over tendency. Uh, so in other words, if the wind is coming from my right side, the parachute's going to want to drift to my left, not just in terms of the ground track, right, the side slide, which gets worse by flaring, because I lose airspeed and I slide uh, faster. But the other thing that tends to happen is the parachute wants to tip over towards that direction. You actually get roll axis change, turning you towards downwind unless you're aware of it. So if you know that the wind is gonna be sort of coming from your left side and sliding to your right, and then roll you that way, as you flare, lean on your windward leg strap. In this case, the wind is coming from my left side, so I'm gonna lean on my left leg strap. As I do that, it's gonna sort of hold my heading, but it's also gonna keep my roll closer to zero. Uh, and if I you know, sort of hold that as I finish the flare, I'll, I'll even rotate just a little bit into the wind, which is going to prevent my side slide. The more I can kind of bring myself in that subtle correction into the wind line, um, the less I'm, I'm going to drift, and the more linear my path is going to be across the ground, right? So they don't flare and slide sideways into somebody else's lane, right? <laughs> so it's not about your heading, it's about where you're going, your ground track. Um, there's certainly a lot to think about here, there's a lot to work on, um, but if you, uh, if you really think about it and you really practice this kind of a flare uh, up high a whole bunch of times, um, I think you'll find a crosswind landing is, is a very reasonable thing to do and it's very useful, it's very important, because many, many times you find yourself in a situation where we have to land crosswind, all of us. And uh, if you can't do that without crashing, it's a dangerous day for you to be jumping. So. Uh, that's uh, that's the purpose of, of this specific jump, at the very least, to plan it. But I think it's important uh, for you to go ahead and do a crosswind landing once you and your coaches believe that you're ready for that.